Hi, this is Bob Sorrentino from Italian Roots and Genealogy, and I'm here today with Dan Nemec, and we're going to talk about his Italian roots. So welcome, Dan. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much for talking to me. Oh, my pleasure. So uh, let's start out this way. Uh, where are your Italian roots from, or part of Italy? My Italian roots are from a little town called Trigiano, T-R-I-G-G-I-A-N-O, and that's uh, on the Achilles heel of the boot uh, near Bari. Uh, so um, when did you get the bug to start researching your family? Well, <clears throat> I'm an only child, and we would go to the wakes and weddings, and they all knew who I was. My dad's Polish, great big Polish guy, so they knew him. They knew, you know, uh, you know we had second cousins, third cousins kind of a deal. And so everybody knew who I was, and they'd all pick me up, you know, as a little kid, and they'd kiss me like crazy. I'm you know, a typical, and I'd be like, what's this? Because my immediate cousins never did any of that. And, um, and I didn't know, I couldn't remember all their names. There were so many of them. I felt like a fool. I'm like, Hey, cuz. Um, so I'm like, okay, I've got to, again, so I'm, I'm in my young, you know, preteens and then teens. And I'm like, I got to figure these people out. There's too many of them. So I made, so I start writing down, I talk to my mother's mom. And I start writing down just her siblings, okay? She, now, my mother's mom is Irish. And uh, so she had eight siblings. And I'm just starting that process. We're talking the early 90s, late 80s, maybe. And that started it. And I'm like, okay, now I, where are all these people? Well, most of them are gone already, okay? And, uh, you know, so that was just that family. My dad's was easy. He had one brother. My mom's one of eight, so I have we have a we have a big group, and then it expanded from there. And uh, so yeah, so it's been about thirty years of actually looking at official records rather than just talking to relatives. Yeah, so it must have been a real challenge back then because there was no internet. You are correct. Yeah, I I grew up in Burbank, South Suburbs, and so we were only a few miles away from the National Archives uh, branch on Seventy uh, Third and Pulaski. So I spent my Tuesday nights there quite a bit, did not at the time know what a family history center was or what microfilm was that came a little bit later. And uh, so, yeah, so I was looking up census records in sound decks, cards, you know, fit microfilm mm -hmm. in sound decks order. Yeah, I uh, if I ever have children or grandchildren, I'm going to be like, so back that back in my day, oh, <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, we, we, any of us who've been at it for a long time have bad memories of, I could have done that in two tenths of a second on family search, you know? Right, right. Uh, so now, so you have you have the Polish, Irish, and Italian. How did they all wind up in Chicago? Uh, well, the Polish, I the, my, my timing is, is always impeccable. I waited until everybody had passed away who had come over from Europe before I started this. Um, I mean, I, I know a lot of people who wait until they are retirement age to start this. And of course they don't even have parents much less, you know, but, uh, my, my, my dad's parents came from Poland when they were little kids, their parents brought them over. Um, and, uh, then my, and my mother's father is my Italian ancestor. I'm only a quarter, uh, Italian, but, um, he left the family when my mom was maybe 12 or 13 years old. So not only did we not, I never met him, but we never, uh, you know, the, the, I didn't get to talk to anybody about the trip over. You know, he came over also as a kid when his uh, mother brought him over. Um, my grandmother, my Irish grandmother was uh, fourth generation. They were, the Rileys were here in Chicago before the famine, slightly before the famine. So they either were hungry already or they, whatever it is, I, I, obviously no way to find out why they left, but they were in the Chicago City Directory in 1842-43. So, um, yeah. so they have so, a different story than the standard, yeah. Yeah, so when you say your grandfather left, I mean, he just left? <laughs> he, yeah. He just left, left. Yes, there. Yeah, there, there was. There's some sordid story about something that happened. It, it wasn't just. 
I, I've never heard anybody say that he cheated on grandma, but he was not very nice. And, uh, and then he had something happen uh, of a legal nature and um, he, he didn't serve any time for it or whatever, but he ended up, he, he left the family. He had a, it's a long, bad story. He died in, he died at uh, 90. Um, he did meet up with some relatives in the eighties and I got pictures of those cause he, he actually took the family pictures when he was still with my grandmother and threw them in the fire. Really? So he not only didn't help wow. me with my research, he hindered it. Mm. Uh, so I call him when I give my presentations, I say my sainted grandfather, you know, <laughs> so as not to use a bleepable expletive, but yeah, he, he was, he was a, a piece of work. Of course, I never met his parents. They died long before I was, uh, hatched. And, um, so I have, he had a baby sister. He had two, well, he had two, two baby half sisters, Francis and Mary. Um, Francis was, uh, passed away a few years ago, uh, 10 years ago. And she and I would go back and forth with stories, but she was born in Chicago and her younger sister, Mary would go back and forth with stories also born in Chicago. And the two stories never matched up. Um, you know, that, oh, that's, well, how could she know she wasn't there, you know, and oh, she wasn't born yet. What could that, so, I, you know, you learned, it, it's like, all right, well, you take down everything and the 2% that matches up, that's probably the truth, you know, um, and, uh, yeah, the set, the younger, the baby sister just passed away last November, a day short of 101. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I spent, you know, 20 some odd years, 30 years picking her brain, for everything it was worth, you know, because that's all I had. But, you know, my grandfather lived in their building for a while, and that's why I couldn't go visit, it turns out. my, my um, They lived on uh, um, Huron in Chicago Street and uh, near uh, Damon, whatever, and uh, my dad's mother lived on Superior Street. So we were a block away, and I knew I had cousins there, but I couldn't go over there because my grandfather was there. That, wow. that was the reason why I couldn't see these cousins. So once that all ended, I was able to start seeing them again. All all this drama, you know. Yeah, you well, think you Dynasty know, and Dallas have drama? No, we've got we've got our own right do. here. <laughs> uh, so what did he do? What kind of what was his occupation? That's a good question. I'm not sure he had one. Um, <laughs> uh, he my my, you know my, my I I think if I well. That was the problem is I could have asked, I, I tried to ask my grandmother and she basically denied having ever been married to him, even though they had six kids together. You know, she just, wow. I don't remember. So she was, she was one of those. My, my, my mom's not much of a talker either. She's, she's her mother's daughter. There's no doubt on that. And I'm my father's son. I can't stop. Um, but uh, yeah, his, his occupation. Um, I think he just bounced around. I, they, they, they moved fairly frequently when uh, during the 30s and early 40s, um, you know, I say basically they moved when the rent was due and uh, oh. but they were they were on uh, they were on Grand and Ogden and uh, then they were on Ohio Street, I think. And then they ended up more closer on Grant to Grand and Western. They just kept, they kept moving west. If he would have stayed with the family, they'd have ended up, you know. Uh, Grand Avenue would have diagonaled up and they'd ended up by Irving Park Road or something. Who knows where they would have been. But uh, yeah, he 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 did not have a career. He had a series of little, you know, whatever jobs he could get. Again, the, the 30s is the Depression, obviously. So that probably didn't help. Um, but my grandma did some of the working, too, back in those days, which was you know a little unusual. But I, you know, anybody would take any work they could get if they, you know, um, I have no idea if he again, because I couldn't talk to him, uh, if he helped out during the war, you know, after he left us, you know, got a war job, I'm going to presume he did, but, you know, he's too old to serve. Mm. So he's born yeah. in 1905. So that's yeah. something. You, you, asked a, you asked a very good question. And the answer is, I don't really <laughs> don't know. know. <laughs> so, so, what, you know, whether it's the, 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 the Polish family or the Irish family, the Italian family, what kind of interesting facts have you found out about any of your ancestors? Facts? Yeah, that, the facts are the tricky part. Um, well, the um, my, my grandfather was not much of a dad, and that may come from the fact that his father died when my grandfather was not even one. 
Mm. Um, my great grandfather's name was Carlo Lituri, and we have several Carlos, of course, in the family due to the naming uh, conventions. Uh, but the great grandfather died uh, March 8th, 1906, on the day he arrived at Ellis Island. Wow. And yeah, and, and now that's one I got 19 totally different stories from people who, of course, weren't there and don't know, you know, they 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 heard it from who knows who. And um, so it took a long time for me to find the truth out. But I finally found a passenger list. He did not come through. Uh, no, he, he came through. Yeah, he came through New York. But the other family came through his wife and widow and his kids came through Boston in 1914. So I presume Boston. OK, I ended up finding him. It's stamped right on the passenger list. Died in hospital. So hmm. what hospital, you know? So I'm writing to New York, trying to figure out what hospital, um, you know, Ellis Island had its own hospital, but it had burnt down. It turns out 1900, they hadn't totally rebuilt it yet. So I actually found in an Italian microfilm that they had sent back a copy of his death certificate to Trigiano. I guess, you know, somebody had to tell his wife that she's a widow now. And that told me that he died at Long Island College Ospedale in uh, that they, they translated into Italian, of course, for them and in uh, Brooklyn. So I wrote to Kings County and I finally got a copy of his death certificate, which didn't say much on it. He was 31. He had a suffered a pulmonary edema. So it's lung related. And what's screwy is that when you get on the boats, a lot of people don't know this, but when you get on the boats over there, you get a full medical exam over there. Everybody talks about the one you get at Ellis Island, but the one you get in Europe, wherever you're leaving from, is to make sure that you're not bringing a nasty disease onto the boat, which is then going to spread to everybody on the boat. And um, and also then when they have to take you back, that's precious cargo space that's now occupied by a sick person. Mm. And they don't make any money off that. So they get they have to pay a fine, and they have to bring back the sick person if they are too sick to stay in America. So uh, they checked everybody thoroughly, and evidently they didn't check well enough. The, the the death certificates, I finally got the microfilm, and the first seven or eight of them are all people that were on that boat and died within the first week. Wow. So whatever they got was nasty. And um, who knows whether they would have died had they stayed back in Italy is, is anybody's guess, but... Uh, it does say that it was something nasty and contagious. So that's, that's a, so uh, the finish of that story is that, uh, so he grew up without a dad, his mother remarried. Um, it took about a year for her to remarry. And that's a long time over in Italy. When you've got a bunch of kids to raise, the remarriages would certainly, they would happen two to three months after. If somebody died over there, let's say, if he'd have died in, in, in Italy, and she'd have been there right that moment. They would have somebody would have already been writing names down to um, hook her up with, um, you know, within at the funeral probably <laughs> by uh, by the end of um, you know a couple of three months you're remarried because you need an income, you need a worker, and you know, uh, same for the men too. If the men were widowed, um, you know, childbirth, but women died in childbirth. Well, now I've got five kids to raise, and I got to go to the field and work, you know, so. Uh, but I, so she remarried and then he came over, left her pregnant with her first child with him. So that kid didn't meet his father until he was seven because they all came over seven years later. It took seven years to get the money over to Italy to bring the brood over. So, wow, that's so that's so interesting. And, you know, you don't think about people dying as soon as they get here. I, you know, my my um, cousin, she's she's my fourth cousin and. And our families were connected for a long time, and we didn't even know know it until we found each other. But her um, great grandmother, um, I don't know if it was coming back this way or going back. I think it was going back to Italy, but she disappeared off the boat. And 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 of course, n nobody knows what happened. I, I mean, Linda kind of suspects that maybe there was some sort of foul play, but you know. Nobody knows for certain. She just well, that that's, disappeared. That's what that's what I was told originally about my great grandfather. Uh, that, you know, he 
I heard I heard that he fell off the boat, and of course they didn't retrieve him. That he was pushed off the boat. That he was got into an argument with a Greek, or I, the the nationality changed every time the story <laughs> was told. I'm like, okay, so none of you actually know. And and you know, finding the truth is it says it's boring. He died of a disease. They took him off the boat, and probably just the act of moving him off the boat. Um, you know, put things into overdrive and uh, he didn't make it the, that, that day, you know? And um, so, uh, so his, uh, so he's buried in a pauper's grave in uh, Brooklyn. You know, they just, they just, where, wherever they put the, un, you know, the indigent population that had no relatives and his son, my grandfather is buried in a pauper's grave in Willow Springs because when he died, he had none of his rel he had no connection with any of his relatives. And, uh, he uh, lingered in the Cook County morgue for three three weeks, and nobody claimed him, and so they put him in the you know. So so I got two two generations buried unmarked, don't know where they are. You know, the, you see the end of um, um, Amadeus where they just sort of throw Mozart yeah. into this common pit. Yeah, so that's my grandpa and great grandpa. How do you like that? Wow, that's that's something, that, and and sad too. But I yeah. guess they had to notify Italy. Because they I'm, I'm wondering how they knew who to contact because yeah. the passenger list, yes, it says that uh, who he left, but not like a, an address. So they just probably put a name and Trajano, Italy and put it in an envelope and send it over there or, or they sent it to the city hall. Um, it must have been city hall because it was on the microfilm from mm -hmm. their yeah. records. So it's a good thing they had that. But it was, um, you know, they had they had the, the whole record translated. uh uh, into Italian, not that there was much on it, um, but uh, it was just like, oh, okay, you know, after all the hunting in America, I finally found my American death in Italy of all places. But uh, well, so yeah, there, there's yeah. there are there are records um, separate from the main death records. You get toward the back end, the, the the main death records in Italy are in nice format. You can kind of figure them out if you're not good with the language. But then at the end, they're all written in longhand and they go on and on and on forever. It's all legalese. And you go, oh, those are a pain. But, you know, when you read them, you find out, OK, somebody died in a mining accident in Hibbing, Minnesota, and somebody else, uh, you know, died, uh, just, you know, picked up a disease, got tuberculosis and died in Chicago or whatever. And you get copies of their death certificates in the Italian records. It's a, a surprise. And especially when you don't know the backstory. Yeah, and I didn't know that. That's that's very interesting. Um, I had no idea that they that they were doing that. I, there's actually there's a there's a separate batch of records that uh, later on called the Allegati di Morti, and so those are death records where there are other pieces of paper, and it might be actual copies of the American uh, death certificates, the piece of paper that was sent over. So you might find it there, and then you know exactly where to look. To find it here you know so that yeah. so those are I, yeah there's I mean, all kinds maybe, of uh, surprises yeah, maybe they, out there maybe they they knew somebody over here or had a friend or something and that, that they would say well he's got family you know she's got family in italy or something like that you know maybe, i i did notice one thing i on the passenger lists in the 1910s of people coming into chicago that there were a lot of people who are going to end up at 515 north milwaukee avenue i mean <laughs> dozens of them and you just wonder whether or not that was one guy who was sort of quote unquote sponsoring. Uh, I can't imagine that they had enough room at 515 North Milwaukee <laughs> to house all these people, but they were all from Trajano. And uh, huh. so it's, uh, you know, the, the, it, it had to be a little bit foolish that uh, the guy's writing on the passenger list, which that was written in Italy, not here. And, you know, we're at 515 Milwaukee, 515 Milwaukee, really? You know, what kind of <laughs> hotel is at 515 Milwaukee? Uh, well, it was probably then, it was probably more based on cash flowing from one way place to another. <laughs> it, it, well, it, it, there wasn't a lot of flowing of, of cash, it, uh, you know, that. but it, as as I'm sure many of your guests have told you, uh, I can speak for the, the Bari uh, people as well, that. Uh, the husband or father would come over first That's right. or he'd come over. The, uh, 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 and a lot of uh, Italian men, because they were conscripted into the Italian army at 18, you find a tremendous number of 17-year-olds uh, who said, you know what, I'm going to head to America. That's the better of the two options. 
So they ended up heading uh, here at 17. My gra uh, grandfather's oldest brother came over at 17. He was actually the, uh, he got here before his stepdad. So, and that's uh, the other, the other thing that I've never found a good answer to, and maybe you've heard from somebody else, but my grandfather, he came over in 1905. His father, of course, never became a citizen because he lived here less than a day. And so my grand my grandfather never, as far as I can tell, became a United States citizen. And he would have gotten grandfathered in from his dad, but his dad died. So his stepdad became a citizen. Now I asked John Philip Coletta, Dr. Coletta, the probably the best known uh, uh, expert on immigration. And he said, yeah, I said, do you get grandfathered citizenship from a stepdad? And he said, I, I really don't know. I said, well, good. If you don't know, I don't feel bad about not knowing. Um, but there had to be something there, you know, because um, otherwise, otherwise he died in alien <laughs> in 1995, you know, or whatever, he, whatever the, te yeah, it wouldn't have been called that in 95, but he would have died, he died not a United States citizen. Yeah, well, so, I only had out of my four grandparents, only my father's father naturalized. My my father's mother never naturalized because she probably didn't need to have to. He probably did it. I'm guessing because he did it in uh, thirty nine, and probably because he had a business and and all of that stuff. So somebody must have told him he should get naturalized. My grandmother really didn't have any reason to, and my mom's parents, you know, probably didn't have any reason to either but interesting that you say about you know when the italians came over in 1905 my uncle was left behind when my grandparents came over in 1915 and he came in 1950 and had to go through canada and he came by himself to canada and then eventually you know the rest of the family came over and you know we're talking 1950 now so it was still happening in the 50s and 60s you know, well, I think I, I think to. where they came through, everybody presumes New York. And I spent a lot of time presuming New York until I found they came. The others came through Boston. Mm -hmm. um, but I the other uh, the, the, the other kicker is that it was simply a matter of money. I mean, it, it, if, if it was cheaper to go through Boston, it didn't matter where they were going through as long as they could get then travel to Chicago, which would have presumably been by train in the 1910s or whatnot. Um, so they had to have the, enough money getting on the boat to make sure that they could buy a train ticket to Chicago to meet up with somebody. It's not like they got picked up in the jalopy and dr driven across the country, you know, not in those days. So it's, uh, you know, it, it, so they could come, they could have come in a, a lot of different ports and, you know, you get, if you got people from Sicily, you know, they had a lot more family down in, uh, Louisiana and they, they go all the way down there. Um, so, and then, and then even there, they come to Chicago. It's like they met up with somebody in, in New Orleans and, and, uh, and then, okay, now they take the train or who knows what to, to get to Chicago. So the, the, the trick was that a lot of people got on the boat with enough money for the ticket. And then the money would either get ripped off mm -hmm. by someone else who didn't have enough, or, uh, they'd gamble, play a little cards and, uh, somebody have a run of bad luck and they'd get off the boat without any money. So they'd get stuck at the hotel at um, hotel, you know, that we're not talking uh, high class, <laughs> not talking to Hilton here uh, at uh, Ellis Island. And they'd have to wait for somebody to, you know, Western Union some money. And that wasn't easy back then either. So so now have you gone back to Trigiani at all? Have you been, been back? Yes, I have. Thank you for asking that. Uh, that's yeah, I it was I I spent basically the first this is this is a research journey because a lot of people make I'll call it a mistake. Maybe it's not a mistake to them and that's fine. But they make the mistake of I'm going to start doing my research and 10 minutes later they're on a plane to Europe. <laughs> not the way to do it if you're going to do well with your research. The as again many of your guests have probably pointed out at least if they're researchers you there are the civil records for most of the southern half of Italy certainly for the Kingdom of Two Sicilies, which would include Bari, are in uh, 1809 to 1900, 1910, minor now to 1945. Um, and they're on familysearch.org. So you can research anything you want and work on it and get back. So I basically spent 10, 12 years 
getting everything done I could possibly do. And of course, now you get a marriage in 1815. They're born before the 1809 records, and now you're stuck. Okay, so uh, cut to 2011, and I get an email from a fellow named Paolo Ferrara. He's living in Paris, France, but his family is from Trajano and, and later the city of Bari. And he says, hey, I see you're researching Trajano. Uh, I'm from the Ferrara family. What do you got? What can you do? So I had about 300 Ferraras in my records at that time. This is 2011. I, I sent him all connected trees and everything else. I said, I don't know where you fit into all this, but here's what I've got. He was so, he, he didn't expect much or anything. So he was so thankful. I got to help you. I got to help you. What can I do? I said, lunch is out. You're on another continent. We can't go to lunch. You know, you can buy me a drink, whatever. So he says, I'm going to go to the church in Trajano. I said, mm, okay. He's not a genealogist. I don't know what he's going to do. So he goes to visit. He send, He says, I'm going to send you. Uh, I make copies of the entire baptism index uh -huh. of the church of Trajano. Now, anything before 1809, you have to go to the mother church of the town. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make copies of the baptism index. Now, I don't know what that means. If it's an index like I've seen, it could just be a name and not much else. Might not be very helpful. I need people connected to parents to make the tree get bigger. So he says this is on its way. So he tells me this in the first week of September. I'm sorry, if I said 2011, I correct myself, 2001. I'm going to send this to you, September of, two, uh, of uh, 2001. And... um so it's in so this package of I don't know what is in the air when the 9 11 attacks happen and all the flights stop. I'm like, I got this gift from heaven coming, and now it's maybe it's never going to make it. So I finally, like late September, I get this box. It's a book with every name from 1700 to 1787. Here's the name, and they had three or four Christian names on the baptisms in those days. And the name of the dad, the name of the mom, and the date of the baptism for everybody in the town for 87 years. I, I went crazy. So it took me a year to plow through all that and update my tree. And I said, well, now I've got to go see what he missed. So I, that, your question was about the trip. So we're, we're now in the mid-2003, and I told some of my relatives, I said, I'm going to Italy, and I'm going to go work at the church. Uh, I got an email address for the parish priest, which is kind of rare, and I wrote him a letter. I had it translated in proper Italian. The computers didn't do very well back in those days, as I'm sure you're aware, and I sent him a note saying I want to come and work in your church and uh, try to add to my family tree. I know what I'm doing. I know how to read the records. I just need access, and he says come at such and such a date, so I planned my trip around that date, and five of my relatives said, oh, great. We're all going to Italy. <laughs> Okay, well, then we're all going to Italy, but I'm going to be in the church doing research. You guys do whatever you want. So uh, September of 2003, when travel was not easy internationally, thanks to 9-11, we hopped a flight and we spent two weeks. Um, I spent four hours in the parish church. The, the day I went there, they didn't let me in and I thought my trip was over. And then I went the next day and they let me in, I guess my perseverance. And uh, they put me in a room uh, back by the a little, little library, a bunch of books uh, behind back behind the altar in this building that had been built in 1580 or whatever. And then they left the building and locked me in because they, they had to go to lunch. Lunch in Italy is multiple hours. You're grinning because <laughs> you know. Yep. And um so I'm like, okay, I know what kind of time I've got. I, you know, I didn't know what I was going to be able to get or how many days I was going to be able to do it. But my goal was I want to have the last book back in the shelf when I'm uh, done with it. And I want to be kneeling, saying a prayer to thank the Lord for giving me that gift when they walk back in. I didn't want them to be like, come on, get out of there, you know, I, because I thought that would cost me access in the future. So I did, I, I, I took a zillion pictures of the records. Uh, so that I could work on them and, on my own time at home. And then I breathed a sigh of relief, and then I could enjoy being with the cousins and family and so forth. My my grand aunt, who the, she was 80 when she went with us, 
Uh, she um, she finally met some cousins who had never come over here, and so that was so they talked in dialect. Mm-hmm. Jenna's dialect sounds or Brabantes, I should say, sounds yeah. very. It's the vowels sound French. It doesn't. None of it sounds like regular classic textbook Italian. So we I didn't understand well. a word they were saying. <laughs> And so they were sitting there telling stories and that the push the that should do blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and we're five, five medic ons, me and my cousins and are just looking at each other going, well, they're having a good time, I guess. So we start telling jokes in English, you know, the two guys with a parrot on his shoulder and one bumps <laughs> into a bar and <laughs> and they looked at us. I said, that's how it feels. <laughs> but well, we, had, know, we had a beautiful I- time. We spent 10 days getting fed. I never lost the weight I gained over there. That's how. <laughs> and um, and then we, we spent three days in Rome as tourists. And, it, you know, we enjoyed it. But it's like we're no longer being waited on hand and foot. They're not taking us to visit places. It's just we're on our own now. And uh, so it was it was cool. But it was kind of an anticlimax, if you will, uh, to 10 days with Familia. And now they introduced us to so many people and. Um, oh, it here's okay. Here's the funny story. I'm just walking down the block, and there's a lady sitting on her front step. She's got this kind of gnarled, angry look on her face. We're dressed like American tourists, of course, so she knows I don't belong there. And uh, I just said to her, you know, buongiorno, uh, you know, uh, me, uh, uh, me, uh, uh, Daniel, uh, sono di Chicago. And that's as much Italian as I know to this moment. And I don't even know that. And she says, oh, Chicago, Al Capone. <laughs> and I said, no, Al Capone in mort. <laughs> mort. You know, I, it, I, 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 I told that story. Everybody cracked up because it's like, that's really what we're, we're still known for. Thank you. You know, <laughs> thanks, Al. Thanks for that. I, I go all the way to Italy. And nobody said, "Oh, you know, some businessman." Well, you know, it's funny. We were we. I was told when we were there last year um, that uh, you Americans all you make it you make your tomato sauce with ketchup, and I was like, "No, no we're not that bad." No, not <laughs> not, not us. No, we're not that bad. <laughs> yeah, the ones who don't have ancestry here might make it with ketchup. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, no, we it, 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 it if nothing passes down the the generations, it's recipes. I mean that that's that's the important stuff. It it it's you know my my family, my mother learned how to cook from her Irish mother. She had to cook some stuff for grandpa, I guess. Uh, it's, that's yeah, that's that's not favorite, an easy word. My favorite uh, Italian restaurant in Chicago, I just north of north of the town. Oh, I don't remember the exact section. Uh, Rose Angeles. Okay. Uh, it was in a little, it was in a, actually in a house. It was, you know, the, the, it was a house. They they converted the house and they had a little garden and it was such a great place. And they've, I guess, I guess maybe COVID knocked them out, but uh, I love that place. Um, COVID knocked a few out. Yeah. They, it, it's, it's not the same to go to a nice sit down Italian restaurant and have a takeout order delivered in a bag in a <laughs> microwave dish. It's just not the same. And of course they lose their alcohol sales when you can't sit inside and have a drink. So uh, yeah, I'm surprised to, you know, some of these places did just well enough. They had enough reserves of cash to survive. Um, and uh, fortunately I found Mambo Italiano, which is exactly halfway between where I work and where I live. And I, I only live five minutes from work. And so my car just turns itself, even if I'm not going to go there. My car just <laughs> says, you want to eat here tonight? Okay, I guess I'm going to do that. And that's, you know, there they 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 do everything so well there. Not to, it's not meaning to be a plug because I don't know who's going to see this at the end. But it's uh, that's mine. You know, I, there's some places. There's obviously places all over the city that might have legendary reputations, but I don't want to drive all that way if I can help it just for, you know, just for a meal, you know, that's, that's a long, if I'm, if I'm with somebody, then it's like, okay, Tommy's steakhouse, you know, that kind of, there, there's some places, but. Uh, well, I had, I had the luxury in that I was, uh, uh, 
being paid by Chase Manhattan. So, uh, you know, we got to, we got to go. You didn't, you didn't hurt uh, their bottom line to too much. <laughs> Even if you go. really we hit up. Well, I keep, well, I keep well, saying we got it. 60, we got $65 a day for dinner. So that was your per diem. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. yeah. No, I, 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 my, my, um, if there's a bucket list item and I know I'll never fulfill it is to be able to sit down at Rayo's in New York uh, that, you know, I know that from a documentary with Dick Schapp, the sports writer mm -hmm. who's been gone a long time now, he said, I had a standing Monday reservation and the standard, you call them up for a table. It's a year. That was, yeah. that was yeah. in the 1990s. Yeah. So I, it's like, you know, that's like getting on Bozo circus here in Chicago. You know, you, you had a seven year waiting list. So you're by the time your little kid gets his tickets, he doesn't care about Bozo anymore. You know, the, uh, the show, you know, there's like, oh, that's lame. You know, uh, you know, I, I joke that my tickets came in last month, you know, <laughs> but well, uh, see, I didn't know there was a Bozo in Chicago. I was on Bozo in New York, mm -hmm. uh, I guess maybe uh, 1959, 60, something like that. But I didn't have to wait because my father worked for the Daily News and wow. WPIX that, hope you know, had the Bozo show was a subsidiary of the Daily News. So. It's all and vice versa, but I it's who I you know. Right in. <laughs> I'll tell you the funny <laughs> thing about it is my dad knew he knew all the celebrities. There was this officer Joe Bolton. But anyway, we're walking around through the studio and everything, and my dad takes us in to meet Bozo, and he's in the clown. This is the funniest thing I ever saw. I think he's in the clown costume with the big clown feet, and he's sitting with his feet up on the desk on the telephone. And it reminds me of the clown on The Simpsons who had the same yeah, character. Right. It was just like that scene. But real we, I, I didn't get to see, yeah, I didn't get to see the um, private side of Bob Bell, who was Bozo at the time or whatever. But, you know, that, that, was, that was a legendary. They still to this day on, you know, WGN, everybody knows that from Superstation and watching the Cubs uh, nationwide back when that happened. But uh, WGN had... They had the Bozo show. They had um, there were three or four different kid shows that were all on uh, Ray Rayner. You won't know him, but uh, he was you know, he, he would cook a turkey every Thanksgiving. It would fall on the ground and everything. It's like, who's going to eat that now? Uh, but it was uh, those shows were legendary and you wanted to get on them if you possibly could. And uh, so uh, it, it was it's like, OK, you know, literally parents were like, OK, they're in the. They're in the maternity, giving birth. It's like, don't forget to call for the bozo ticket so this kid gets to get on when they're young enough to care. You <laughs> yeah, know, yeah. It, it was so it, it just got to be a joke that there's a seven year waiting list, but it was a little studio. Well, move it to a bigger studio. Uh, you know, you let let there be four thousand kids there every day screaming and yelling. It would have been a bigger show, but yeah, I think I did. think it was so. I mean there it was probably so 20 badly, of us or something like that. You know? Yeah, it was so badly acted. I mean, it, we watch now. because Every year they show a highlight show at Christmas time of stuff from all those kid shows. And, uh, you know, and it's just it's like they're throwing pies and they miss. And it's OK. The whole <laughs> sketch was predicated on getting hit with the pie and he missed them. And now there's no more pies left. And they're <laughs> laughing because they know it's all screwed up. It, 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 it's about as bad as a Tim Conway, Harvey Corman crack up on the Carol Burnett show, you know, it's like, uh Oh, now what's going to happen? Harvey's laughing. So it's like that anyway. Well, we had, we had a great show over here. We had soupy sales and, uh, uh yes. And, uh, he, he threw a pie at Frank Sinatra. So <laughs> it got away with it. <laughs> that's some, that's some serious guts. Yes. <laughs> it got yes. Away with it. Um, and, uh, just, you know, before we go, I just want to ask you, uh, have you done your DNA, uh, test? I have done that, yes, um, because I've got a great great grandfather who uh, was a foundling, so there's no parents listed for him. So he's in a separate set of records called Ati Diversi, and he um, uh, uh, so he's born in 1855, and I have no idea who his parents are. I have everybody else back, basically to the mid 1600s at this point, and then I made the onious decision. I don't know if that's the right word of uh, doing the descendants of all those ancestors. Okay. So I've got 90 some thousand people mm, in my mm -hmm. tree. And of course it's keeping track of the living ones is, is a nightmare because you don't know who they all are and where they are. But um, 
the um, where was I going with this? The uh, um, oh, uh, so I I did the DNA specifically so that I might be able to trip over someone who's related through his parents. But the trouble is, is I'm related to everybody else in the town anyway. Yeah. So I have to know anybody who's a DNA match that's from there, that comes from there. It's like, okay, so my computer says I'm their seventh cousin. The DNA says I'm their fourth cousin. Ah, okay. That means that they're tied to somebody else. Now, my guy could have been born in a different town nearby and then left on the, you know, the uh, doorstep, if you will, Um you know, he they they gave him a Santo Liquido. They give him a, so he got left at the church, based on that surname. So um, and I'm like, okay, so what about his kids? His oldest son was Carlo. His oldest daughter was Anna. And okay, so where are the Carlos and Annas? That didn't get me anywhere. So you know, I get they, they don't know who the parents are, so you can't name your kids after your parents anyway. I guess so. Um, yeah, that's still a mystery, but the DNA, I did find, uh, I found an entire line of Nemix in Old Forge, Pennsylvania, based on the DNA. They were too close. To, if if they're in my DNA as a close match and I don't already know who they are, immediately I got to look, okay, who are you? How do you connect? What's going on? So they connected back to this Piotr Nemitz back in uh in in our town in uh, poland and um uh, and that tied him into my line so this whole big family popped up and same thing on the irish i found the first marriage of some you know my great great grandfather's brother that i didn't know about and um got their whole groups so i got a whole bunch of them in joliet illinois and just yeah it, the dna can do amazing things that the records can't when you have these odd uh you know occurrences i will say this the italian records the civil records are very thorough mm -hmm. and very complete you occasionally get uh, a bad uh, name of the mom of a woman who died at 70 which was old age back in those days uh they might not you know if she died young they don't remember who she was so they end up putting the wrong name on a death death record you know, old death record, but most of the records are pretty thorough. The ages are pretty bad. Um, if you're 55, 60, 65 or 70, you should be very scared because that's the year you die. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because a lot of the death records, that's how old they're. They all seem to be divisible by five because they really didn't know. Um, I think the civil records office didn't want to have to contact the church and say, give me a baptism record for this person who died because the church and the state were not exactly getting along. And I still don't think that they do, but they certainly didn't back then. Well, so you know, my cousin, said, yeah, I'll my, my cousin told me that, you know, sometimes they would send the, you know, the, you know, one of the little kids <laughs> to, to the place, you know, this is, this was like in the forties, they would just send anybody and they would, they would ask how old and same thing, you know, uh, uh, 42, 48, whatever. Yeah. Uh, they would just, well, even American something. records. Yeah. Ho American records. When they say hospital records, that doesn't always bode well uh, for, um, you know, you get, you get stuff with the um, maiden name of the mother on a death certificate unknown. And um, you know, and I, I went, I went to a wake one time back in the nineties and I heard that, the sons, this woman was 94 and their kids are in their sixties and they're all talking to each other going, it's too bad. We don't know mom's mother's maiden name. I do. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you better amend that death certificate. You know, How the heck do you know? I, I, I don't think they really knew who I was. I just sort of popped in and uh, cause I had talked to this lady on the phone a few times and, um, uh, on the Polish side of all things. And, uh, so that 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 group of cousins didn't know me, and I'm like, I can help with that. That's um, funny. <laughs> so now I'm, yeah, now I'm the I'm the contact guy. <laughs> if somebody passes away, I, I will know about it. Partly because they're going to call me and say, Do you happen to have her birth certificate? Yeah, I do. And the other one is, uh, um, what was uh, what do they contact? Oh yeah, they contact me. The co cousins I haven't heard from in ten years like to say, Hey, my kid's got a family tree project. Oh. 
And I'm sure the teacher just wants them to hand in somebody else's work, right? Yeah, right. You know, <laughs> so it's like, hey, put your kid on the phone and let's talk. Let's make them earn this A, you know, and then I'll yeah. send them the chart. So, yeah, that that's okay. Keeps me in, in touch with people. And that's probably, honestly, it's the only reason I'm on Facebook is just to stay in touch with relatives all over the place and, uh, you know, and, you know, get updated photos because that's always tricky. It's like, well, here's a photo of a kid is when they're two and they got three kids of their own now got to update that picture so yeah and that's that's pretty much why i stay on there too is my, mainly for that stuff well dan this has been fascinating stories i appreciate you taking the time and oh, uh you know some good insight for for people who are researching in italy for sure oh yeah that's that's the i wish i i don't I don't take on clients directly or whatever. If they find me on Facebook, I'll be glad to direct them uh, to, you know, how to, how to get started. Um, I've been giving, uh, giving a couple of talks at the Italian cultural center in stone park. Of course, by the time people see this or don't, you know, the, the dates might pass, but uh, um, you know, it, it's, it's actually difficult for me to remember how I, what I did to get started. There was no help. There were no Italian genealogy groups. There certainly, as you say, there was no internet. Um, there were three of us at the Family History Center when I first started going there, and we would fight each other to get to the good microfilm reader that could handle the little skinny film. Uh, and so, yeah, we would help each other with how to read the handwriting and what to do. But it's like, man, I can't even remember how horrible that was when I started, and now it's second nature. And... Um, but it's uh, so it's it's tough for beginners. It's very because the a if they don't know the language, you don't need to be fluent. You don't need to have conversation. You just need to read the words in the right spots right. on the page. Yeah. And uh, so it's it's a it's a it's tough. People, they look at it and they go, oh, this is good. And then they see how much work and they get scared. and They take up needlepoint or watch gladiators or whatever. <laughs> Uh, you know, so it's like, don't be scared of it. Um, the, the The benefits and meeting people your fifth cousin twice removed. So what if they're fifth cousin twice removed, you meet people and yeah, uh, find yeah. out that uh, you got some, got some good people out there. Yeah. And then, and there's, there's plenty of hope out there too. So now um, there is, yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks again. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. Hi everyone. This is Bob Sorrentino. Just letting you know that my new book farmers and nobles is now available for sale on www.italiangenealogy.blog backslash farmers and nobles, or you can find the link in the podcast notes. Thanks for listening.